Okay, let's have a look at the legislation. Acts, regulation and approved codes of practice. The main act covering health and safety is the Health and Safety at Work Act 1974, sometimes called HASAWA. Now the act has come from the Houses of Parliament, it's a very skeletal piece of legislation, a bit woolly in part, so there are other items of legislation that we find and these are called regulations. These define the act in more detail. Now these are put together by ministers and civil servants. You've got things like the management of health and safety at work regs. You've got manual handling regulations. You've also got cost regulations and workplace regulations. Under that we've got approved codes of practice. These are the sort of documents that the enforcing agents will pay attention to when they're carrying out uh, an inspection for example. We've got EU directives, my least favourite item of legislation, and lastly guidance notes put together by the people that work in the industry to even define the regulation and improve codes of practice in more detail. Under the Health and Safety Work Act we've got a criminal and we've got a civil court system. Criminal, first of all, deals with a company or a business or a person being prosecuted because they've caused an accident or an illness at a place of work. It's prosecution by the state in a criminal court and the purpose is to punish. There's a prosecutor and defendant. They're innocent until proven guilty and it's got to be beyond reasonable doubt. And it's heard by a judge and jury in a crown court and heard by a JP in a magistrate's court. And the punitive measures can be fines and or prison sentence, so it could be both. Now the civil court deals with compensation claims, so if a person has received an injury or has received an illness as regards where they work, then they would take it to a different court, to the civil court, to claim compensation. And this is action for damages. The purpose is to compensate, there's a claimant and defendant, and it's all to do with the balance of probability. Who was ultimately responsible for the accident or illness? Was it 100% the employer? Or might it be sort of, I don't know, 25% the employee? And depending who was responsible, the percentage of probability, that would determine the amount of compensation that's paid. This is heard by a judge in a county or high court, or sometimes called a family court. And it's all to do with compensation. Now, health and safety law is the responsibility of everyone. It's the responsibility of employers, employees, self-employed, manufacturers, suppliers and installers. And that really refers to equipment. For example, if you have an accident at work with a piece of equipment, who would you take to court? You might think, oh, I'll take my employer to court. But it might not be the employer. It could well be the people that manufacture the equipment, the people who supply the equipment, or even the people who install the equipment. So they would all be part of that litigation loop. Now, who are the health and safety police? There are three enforcing agencies, and they are the environmental, environmental health practitioners, or officers we used to call them, the health and safety executive inspectors, and lastly the fire officers. Now it's quite straightforward that what duties the fire officers have under health and safety is to do with uh, the condition of the building as regards fire, are there enough fire exits, are they easy to get out of, are the fire extinguishers located in the right places. It does tend to become a bit of a grey area between the EHP and the HSE inspectors, who does what. But in general, the HSE tend to deal with the larger industries, like the construction industry, or perhaps the mine industry, or even the transport industry. The environmental health practitioners deal with the smaller businesses, small shops, offices, small factories, and they also deal with the service industry, uh, industries that provide a service rather than a tangible output. For example, the leisure industry, uh, golf parks, uh, leisure facilities, etc. And the powers of inspectors are quite far ranging. Well, they include, they can enter the premises at any reasonable time of the day or night, in other words, when the premises is normally open. And they can be accompanied by a police constable. 
the uniform police. They can examine and investigate as necessary. They can direct that the premises remain undisturbed. They can take measurements, photos, records, etc. They can retain evidence. They can take statements. They can test equipment. They can dismantle equipment and state that the equipment must not be used or disturbed. During an inspection, the inspection is carried out in a particular hierarchy. First of all, they could issue informal advice during an inspection. They could issue a formal letter or advice issued after an inspection. Or they could issue one of two notices, an improvement notice or a prohibition notice. An improvement notice gives time, usually about 14 days. But if a company disregards the improvement notice, they can be prosecuted. Now these are for things that are not an imminent danger to health, but could prove a problem after a period of time. A prohibition notice, however, is something that can or is an imminent danger to health. This notice could be on just a piece of equipment, or it could be on the whole building itself. And the enforcing agents initiate a prosecution, or they can initiate a prosecution. They don't actually prosecute, it's the courts that do the prosecuting. 